Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the coffee break. I'm Marie Price, and I'm introducing Borders and Their Discontents. We have two political geographers speaking. Uh, Guntram Herb will be uh, speaking to us from Middlebury, and Alec Murphy. Uh, Guntram's paper, Erasing the Other, is a, a very rich discussion, particularly of German mapping after the First World War, and how extensive efforts were meant in creating representations that would help to make the German claims for lost territory stronger and the, the belief in the map in, in doing that. And I think it's important to recognize in the early 20th century, many people thought of this kind of mapping as a precise science. And if you could get the borders right, you could end conflict. Um, so keep that in mind when we hear Gundram's paper. Uh, Alec Murphy is going to talk about sovereignty challenges at interstate borders with two different conflicts and looking at which kind of conflicts might be easier to solve than others. And uh, when I read his paper, I was uh, thrilled that he mentioned a conflict that I know well uh, between Ecuador and Peru. And I will say this, since we are at a gathering of people who love maps, I was in Washington DC where I teach and I was invited to a gathering of diplomats at George Washington University to discuss this conflict. And as an enthusiastic young geographer, I said, I'll bring the maps. And the diplomat looked at me in horror at Perali's uh, observation and said, no maps. And that was the recognition of the power of maps to, to unite people, but to offend people. And I think Ali's discussion of the border negotiations um, at the Ottoman Empire really speaks to, to those subtleties. So diplomats don't always love maps the way geographers do. So with that, I turn it over to Guntram and his talk. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen. And you can see it all okay? Everything good? <clears throat> okay. Um, so greetings, I'm uh, talking to you from Middlebury, Vermont, um, the territories of the Western Abenaki who call this place Ndakina or homeland. And I would like to acknowledge their stewardship of uh, this place and the connection to their region and the hardships that they continue to endure and saying thanks, will you need to them. I also would like to say thanks to Karen Wigan and Martin Lewis for inviting me to join this exciting conference. I have been following it remotely, but nevertheless with my utmost interest and I've been really impressed. Um, wonderful papers, wonderful things to think about. Um, I would like to talk about raising the other maps, bordering and sovereignty, the German case. So I'm gonna do a brief introduction here. I believe mapping borders is key to sovereignty. The process of bordering, defining limits over which power is claimed, what's included, what's excluded. Those, even if the territories are scattered, um, dispersed and Luminous, as uh, Frank Delay uh, so eloquently told us yesterday, even in that case, I think it is difficult to conceive uh, borders without maps. And we can go to history when Europeans chanced upon the Americas, they had, had no idea what lay in this continent. So they used, um, they outlined the imaginary contours of this continent and then drew lines in claiming places they knew nothing about. In the most extreme version, this was the Pope taking the earth like an apple and cutting it in half along a line of longitude, one side to Spain, the other to Portugal. Um, when European powers convened in Berlin in 1884 to 85, to the conference, they sat in front of a gigantic map, wall map, a map that was basically empty, yet they drew lines nevertheless, and lines over spaces whose inhabitants were severely and 
for a very long time affected by those borders still are affected today. Dissection by cartography, if we want to call it that way, is also richly illustrated by this map, the signatures of Molotov and Ribbentrop, the foreign ministers of Nazis and, and the Soviets, um, agreeing on the territorial division of their spheres of influence in a secret addendum to their non-aggression pact of 39, um, another death knell to the Polish state. Those kind of examples were mostly power politics behind the scenes, but something changed in 1919 at the end of World War I. Wilson's 14 points tied sovereignty to self-determination, became a guiding principle for the peace that was to follow World War I. The idea was to give oppressed nationalities what was rightfully theirs, thereby elevating the allied war effort to a just cause and creating lasting peace, it was hoped. The most immediate uh, negative effect was for Germany, who lost about 13% of its territory and 10% of its population. And that impact created a strong and massive reaction among German geographers. It sparked a veritable flood of maps arguing for a return of those territories and more. And since these maps, this flood of maps, this map campaign contained a lot of suggestive maps, persuasive maps, they generally have been dismissed as mere propaganda. I believe and I argue that those maps are actually very helpful in examining them to keep our understanding of sovereignty to a next level. Because the distinction between scientific maps and propaganda maps or persuasive maps, it's a dichotomy that's been questioned more recently by in the literature that we could have to think about um, maps, all maps being rhetorical. And so I would like to, in this paper, go forwards in three steps. I wanna briefly discuss, uh, very briefly, the nature and power of maps. How do I understand the, the role of maps as being really persuasive tools? Um, then very quickly, how did maps as evidence for national claims emerge in Europe? And then thirdly, I will look at this mapping campaign, the mapping of the German nation post Versailles, and I'll look at three elements. I look at the debate over scientific accuracy, then the development of new concepts and designs, and then go into the campaign networks and map agency that was involved and conclude with some general lessons and an outlook. So the nature of maps, from the age of the pharaohs, we know that maps have been associated with power on authority and they have that aura with them. This is a fragment from the Turin uh, papyrus. Maps, we view them as similar to landscapes and they become at once familiar and trustworthy as a result. As Angot Lefska, beautifully illustrates in this quote, the precision of the lines on the map, the consistency with which symbols are used, the grid and or projection system, the apparent certainty with which place names are written and placed, and the legend and scale all give the map an aura of scientific accuracy. So it's really important that maps have always and often been perceived as authentic, as uh, associated with power, and have an aura of objectivity and truthfulness. This goes back to the epistemology of cartographers. Cartographers um, hold the idea that their goal is to represent the world as truthful as possible, as this model explains. This is a view summarized in the communication model, given in known information, gets transformed into a map, then gives to the reader, the reader might give some feedback and evaluation, but the overall goal of this process is to create a more and more accurate map that comes closer and closer to the sending reality. And many cartographers to this day um, held this view, um, as I noticed when I went to Germany and gave a talk about a similar issue and cartographers stood up in sheer horror when I was talking about the rhetorical nature of maps. Jacques Bertin took this a little step further 
um, and actually developed a grammar of signs and variables that would take into account uh, human visual abilities to come up with the most precise way of making the message clear. We see this view of maps as this kind of authoritative, authentic, objective elements also in their uh, character as products of a disciplinary apparatus. So the, there's rules to be followed. They're involved in this disciplinary apparatus are cartographic laboratories, technicians, projection, mathematical conversions. All these elements contribute to making maps this, giving maps this character. J. Brian Harley shook this up in 89 with his articles that looked at maps as discourse and text. And he got a lot of flack from cartographers um, as uh, going against the very nature of their epistemologies. Brian Harley argued that all maps reflect and reproduce the cultural and social context in which they are reproduced. So we show castles on maps, not poor houses. We show those things that are important to our societies. Other things will not be there. So our underlying beliefs and value systems will flow into maps. So suddenly this simple dichotomy, there's the scientific maps, and then there is of course bad maps when people don't use it the right way and try to, to lie. That got kind of disturbed and that got weakened. But even Harley got uh, further uh, criticized um, by people like Dennis Wood, Jeremy Crampton, and Rob Kitchen, Martin Dodge, and Chris Burton, and others, that maps, they argued that maps might be a reflection of a, a social reality, as Harley argued, but actually maps are representations, and therefore can be interpreted in multiple and often contradictory ways. They are, argued by these more recent authors, in a constant state of becoming, they're ontogenetic. And yet all maps appear as naturalized objects with fixed meanings. That's how we engage with them. How is this possible? Well, Judith Butler work on performativity helps us out in this way. The continuous performance and use of maps in the shared cultural context in which that occurs cements particular meanings. And in the German case, we will see that. So now I want to talk about maps as evidence for national claims. Let's look at their role. We know that um, Benedict Anderson, as everybody has to quote whenever you talk about nationalism, because he has just this fantastic title, Imagine Communities, that brings it to a point. All nations are imagined. And this raises the question, if they're all imagined communities, how do you communicate the borders, the lands that this nation claims to the population, to the, net, to the national people. So they all have a consensus about what is it that the nation constitutes. References to rivers and straits and mountains, for example, in the German national anthem, there's from the Mas bis an die Memel, there's, there's limits that are natural that are being uh, portrayed. It doesn't give you a precise image because one, these are kind of fluid sometimes in the case of mountains, which side is it? And they don't all meet up in a precise image. Only maps, I argue, can give you a precise image what a nation is. Now, of course, for nations that emerged within an existing state structure, like the French nation after the French Revolution, um, that's, we would think maps are not really important. Yet, even here, you need to create a consensus. And the example is the French hexagon that Frank Villade explained yesterday. This can be really abstract to the point of just using the actual hexagon in the color of the French flag. So, which allows us also to sidestep the thorny issue of territorial complexities. How do the French overseas territory fit into the hexagon? They don't. Nevertheless, even, a, a, a nation that is within a state needs to communicate to its population what people should identify with. But when the idea of nationalism went to Eastern and Central Europe, it changed fundamentally. Here, nationalism took the form 
of it being inspired not by the Enlightenment, but, the, but by Romanticism. It was the idea that all people can find solace in the organic community of those who speak the same language, share the same customs and the same, and live in the same native soil. They share all this together. The problem is of course in Eastern and Central Europe, nations form a complex mosaic with people interdigitized into each other, uh, to use a more modern terms for this kind of interconnected uh, uh, distribution. And they have language islands or islands of speakers all over Eastern Europe. So it was much more complex to figure out what is the national territories here. And as a result, maps became tremendously important. Ethnographic maps, the distribution of people. And we see that the first maps um, in Europe that portray, try to portray precise distributions of ethnic group, look at all these um, borders that you, are, that you see here, these precise uh, borders. Um, they appear in the springtime of nation when nationalism really emerges strongly in uh, Central and Western Europe, and Eastern Europe. So here is the, the map of uh, Berghaus, Deutschland. Both Bernhardi, the one we just saw, and Berghaus' maps legitimized a distinct German nation for one by using the term Deutschland, Germany, as one. But these maps, even though they look really precise, we're really only bought based on historical records and regional descriptions. A next layer of map actually came around this time as well from this map by the Austrian um, von Karl von Zernig in 1855. This is a four sheet map, large map, that shows the ethnographic distribution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And Austria-Hungary was challenged by this new nationalism that came up. There were over 19 different national groups within it. And this map was based for the first time on census data. And it inaugurated a new type of mapping, precise data collected census data to create scientifically accurate maps. And those were the types of maps that became uh, relevant in the Treaty of Versailles. So German geographers, until the Treaty of Versailles was public, did not much give did not give much attention to ethnic German maps. Once the German first German nation state was founded in 1871, they were happy. They were trying to actually support that state, turned their attention away from that. But when the Germans lost what they considered indisputably German territories, here outlined in red, they took on a charge and said, we have to figure out what went wrong here as geographers. And the first thing they looked at was, well, obviously it must be the wrong data that was used. So they looked at foreign maps that would support those new boundaries. One of them was Jakob Speck map in 1918, which was uh, also published in France in a newspaper. And then immediately the connection was made, aha, this map was used to draw the new boundaries. It was labeled a scandalous falsification by German geographers and said it combined different data sets. So it used census data and then surveys, et cetera. So, um, and then sub subsumed uh, minorities like Kashubians and Missouris under, uh, under Polish uh, nationality and therefore was misleading. One map that became really a focus was also um, the map by Eugenius Romer of the distribution of Poles in his 1916 Atlas of Poland. Again, German geographer said he falsified data and whatever he used whatever data best served the principles um, of, a German, of a Polish claim against Germany. And people, especially one geographer, Albrecht Pink, pointed out that he used ISO lines, lines of equal value that we usually have in topographic maps. He said that's inappropriate for people, it's appropriate for natural features only. And look at the color scheme. He's labeling everything 5% and above as Polish in orange, and then the ones below 5% in blue, giving the impression of a much larger distribution of uh, Polish. And Albrecht Pank, being critical of his map, created a new map. He called it absolute representation 
representing dots, representing numbers of people in specific locations. And here he showed Germans in black, the Poles in just a circle, a white circle, and then the, the half circle for Kashubians minorities to show that there was a continuous German um, access to the sea that, that they should keep and not give to Poland. He also made a more detailed map and really you can see how much work went into this. If we zoom in here, looking at Danzig and again, outlining Poles and Germans and Kashubians in different colors in absolute dots uh, of the individuals. These attacks and this concern with scientific accuracy was not lost in German leaders. In 1938, during the Munich conference, Germans brought settlement maps on ethnographically maps and based on census data to the deliberations. And they used very similar um, color scheme, very effective by labeling anything above 20% as German. And to be really scientific, the more detail, the larger, the better. So the maps they brought to the conference were so large, they couldn't even fit it in the car and had to drive with their top down. Nevertheless, Germans were unable to reclaim all the territories simply on the account of using more accurate data or representations like the absolute one. They realized new geographic concepts were needed. And so the first, again, Albrecht Penck, a famous physical geographer actually comes up and comes up with the concept of the Volks- und Kulturboden, the German national and cultural soil in black, the national soil. This is what they could claim, all the, the black areas uh, with kind of language data, but the, um, all the other gray shaded areas, they could claim by saying this is German landscape. You can actually see it in the landscape that there's an imprint of German culture, more careful use of uh, agriculture, cleaner, etc. Wilhelm Foltz, another geographer, came up with the idea that there were vectors of German culture all over Europe, Eastern Europe, therefore giving claim to Germans. And he summarized it with German, the culture is German, the forest is Polish. Geographers got inspired. Carmen Lautensach, another geographer, came up with a garland of Eastern uh, German uh, borders, borderlines that could be used to define what German the German area was. And when Albrecht Peng's Volks- und Kulturboden concept was combined with these here, the language, the use of German in, in language and commerce, vast areas could be claimed. And this was a very well-designed, very simple map. And Germans also realized that the maps didn't have to be just accurate or have new concepts, but they had to be suggestive. They had to be powerful. And Arnold Hill and Siegfeld, a pan-German who um, developed offices for effective map design in a variety of, of uh, journals, uh, developed a, a specific cartographic style. Now, all these activities, the national mapping campaign is best understood as an assemblage of the network where maps actually have agency. Albrecht Penck were the scientific figures and Wilhelm Foltz. The activist figures were Carl Christian von Lösch and Arnold Hill and Siegfeld, who we just met, who made all these designs of persuasive maps. This idea about persuasive maps kind of also drew from the idea that Germans had lost the war and had lost territory because enemy propaganda was more effective. These networks, scientific and activist, came together in two institutions, the Stiftung für Volks- und die Dubodenforschung in Leipzig. There was Wilhelm Foltz again, Friedrich Metz and Emil Miners were pan-Germans, they were activists and also associated with Albrecht Bank. And the Deutsche Club was a place that had, was a meeting place of activists where Siegfeld and all these other people, they could all socialize and go together. This network actually created a coordination of research and funded activities, authored and edited data collections and publication to arrive at a common understanding of what was rightfully German territory. Penck developed his concept of the Volks- und Kulturboden in this context. 
the paradox was then that they also enforced a unified message in school atlases. And you can see here on the left, the Bellhagen and Classing Atlas from 26, and then the same in 31, how they filled in the areas that had been lost at the Versailles Treaty. The paradox is that this happened when all the while Germans claiming that Germans were being oppressed in the new Polish and Czechoslovak states. Maps actually acquired agency, if you follow network, actual network theory. The scientific maps, the data that was collected became tools of empire. German military used the data in an effort of divide and rule by playing different ethnic groups uh, against each other, knowing which areas not to bomb or attack by having these ethnographic maps. The SS had special commandos that actually collected scientific maps. Anytime they came across a map uh, library, they would bring those maps, put them back to the center of calculation. Research institutes engaged in the mapping of ethnographic territory. So the map, the information that was there then actually dictated what the army would do in the field. Persuasive maps also had agency. The design was much more accessible to a much larger group of people and therefore reached a wider audience. They were ideally suited for schools and education and were dem disseminated widely. And that's when you influence the next generation, the future generation, the young people who are actually founding the national identity, the consensus. All right, now to conclude some general lessons. Maps are powerful, as we know. The ideas of Greater Germany were created with the help of that map campaign I just explained. The maps reinforced the misconception of distinct national territories and, their, and reified their existence. As Latour explains, maps make it possible not only to see the invisible, but to prove its existence, an existence that can be controlled since it's movable across time and space. And here is greater Germany on the right hand, what the Nazis actually controlled, and on the left, what students learned in school, what the rightful German territory was. And there's quite significant overlap there in terms of a consensus. And then if you look at the expansion of this cultural concept into Eastern Europe and look at what Nazi, the Nazis actually conquered, Again, you can see how the Far East here in the, in the East of, of uh, uh, Europe is really strikingly similar to what was outlined. But unfortunately, this is not a historic German case. We know that nationalist mappings will not fade away. The continuing allure of territory, as Alec Murphy has so aptly put it, is there. Now, I wanna end on a more positive note a more promising one. Nationalist maps can also be subverted. Look at Albrecht Penck's dark map. Even a contemporary German geographer was criticizing this map and saying, how can you actually draw a boundary line based on this distribution of this intermixed distribution? So showing maps like these will show you that the borderlands are mixed and bring that out rather than the regular coral cliff maps that, that people are used. And to take it into a whole different example, I created a map with two of my research assistants called Erasing the Line that you saw in the exhibit that argues you, you can actually use Romer's idea of isolines and this effective color scheme and apply it to uh, indigenous populations who are always silenced. Any map you see is usually limits at the border between US and Canada. So you see Native American maps, they stop at the border. Canadian First Nation maps, they stop at the border. This is a way to use either lines to get inspired by the German nationalist mapping to create subversive maps. And maps might be a Foucauldian technology, but they also contain the seeds of subversion. Thank you. Great, good, good morning, or I guess it's just barely good afternoon now. It's a pleasure actually to share this session with Guntram and, and with Marie, both of whom are longtime friends of mine. Um, so I received the invitation to participate in this conference well over a year ago, and it took me about 3.3 seconds to say yes to the invitation. Uh, I think the title was slightly different when it was first pitched, but it, the, the same idea was there and it really resonated with me because 
I teach a class in political geography. I've long been interested in trying to ask sort of critical questions about what's hidden as well as what's revealed when we map political space in particular ways, and particularly maybe the, the typical schoolroom map that we hang up on the walls of not just our kids' rooms, but actually on foreign policy institutes that shows the 190 odd so-called sovereign states of, of, of the planet. I had a bunch of different ideas about what I might do when I got this invitation. Um, one of them was, well, gee, I talk a lot in my classes about what I call stateless zones. So areas within states where the map tells us Somalia looks like this or Cyprus looks like this, but it's a complete fiction. And you can go all the way down to smaller scale areas. You know, the map tells us that Brazil looks like this, but there's no police presence in some favelas in, in Rio and things like that You can uh, at various scales. I thought, well, that's one thing. I, I talk a lot about that, but uh, can I really add anything to, to, to the obvious? Maybe I could if I thought about it. But my second thought was, I did some work on transboundary cooperation agreements some years ago, particularly focused on Europe. And I thought this is an interesting place where we see sort of sovereignty being challenged in, in various kinds of ways. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, if there weren't a pandemic and I could go do some more original research on the ground, <laughs> that might be an interesting way to go. But my third thought, and the one I kind of ended up with, um, was one place in which remapping sovereignty is incredibly relevant is what's hidden behind the schoolroom map of how sovereignty is actually thought about in terms of what it should be along international borders and the conflicts that result from that. And so this kind of not very attractive map uh, from a study that was done a few years ago, trying to show main sort of interstate territorial conflicts, 1947 to 2000, um, shows you something about the wide distribution of these conflicts. And if there's ever an issue where sovereignty is front and center, it's this one. And the reason I thought I might do something with this is the invitation to participate in this conference got me thinking about something that had been troubling me a bit uh, uh, in relationship to a piece I wrote, gosh, 30 years ago. I think it was the early Holocene, maybe when I was working on this, but um, where I made this argument in response a bit to the uh, emphasis on material circumstances that might motivate territorial conflicts and argued, you know, there's a normative environment out there that doesn't allow actually one state to make a very compelling claim that we're entitled to that area because there is bauxite there. The argument is a historical one and uh, that, that's usually made, that it fits within the norms of, of the modern state system as, as it came to be developed. It was once ours, we have the right to take it back, you know, because it, it was right, wrongfully taken from us. And, uh, you know, I still think that was a reasonable argument, but I was, I've been a little troubled over the years by a couple of things. And what most obviously is that a couple of the conflicts that I talked about in that article, one of them being Ecuador, Peru, but another one briefly, uh, Guatemala, Belize have actually somewhat settled since that time. So not all conflicts, even if you can frame them historically, are created equal. So we have some conflicts that have managed to achieve some degree of police of, of, of peaceful settlement, others that, that seem to be uh, quite on, ongoing. So how do we understand that? How do we understand why some of these seem to be more amenable to settlement than, than, than to others? Well, there's a big literature on this, and I just throw up a few examples that try to talk about what gives rise to the peaceful settlement resolution of territorial disputes. Once again, looking at that literature, and this project got me going back and reading some of the more recent stuff that I had a bit, a bit left behind, and I continued to be struck by the fact that the symbolic dimensions, even the kind of nationalist dimensions uh, of, of territorial claims are kind of pushed to the side. I had a great conversation before we started with Jordan Branch, who was basically making the same comment to me. And uh, actually there's a piece that came out just last year, Milones and, and Tudor wrote, and I quote, research illuminating the comparative modalities of nationalism has been comparatively sparse. And it sort of makes the point that there's a lot of discussion of, well, these can be driven by certain kinds of material circumstances or regime types or the influence of certain in institutions that may be there. But what about the way that nationalism and nationalist ideology that goes with this might play into which con uh, conflicts might be a bit more amenable to settlement than, than to others? 
And in thinking about that, I came back to some uh, a concept I was wrestling with some years ago as well, which I called regimes of territorial legitimation. And I owe a specific debt here to Prasenjit Dwara, who uh, wrote about what he called regimes of national legitimation in the context of China, coming gradually a sense of Chineseness that gets sedimented and expanded over time. And I, as much as I liked his work, I thought, well, there's a there's a comparable and goes along with regimes of national legitimation, sense of territory that gets developed. And of course, you know, Guntram's and other uh, uh, presentations we've heard here speak directly to this, of course, as does uh, Tong Chai's book, which has been referenced in uh, some of the presentations yesterday. So I was thinking in, in, if regimes of territorial legitimation, they have different ideological bases. And those ideological bases are in turn rooted in some of the different kind of territorial norms that developed along within, with the modern state system. The idea, and these are ideas, not reality. If we think of these as reality, I need to go up to the top floor and jump. Um, these, are, these are ideals that the land surface of the earth should be divided up into discrete political units, that state should somehow reflect the pattern of nations. In the original sense of the term, of course, a group of people who felt themselves to be one based on a sense of common culture and history, and that states should be free from outside interference within their territories. These principles that gradually developed, and we've heard some of them being referenced in discussions today, they developed and what they mean, what they resulted in is that different regimes of territorial legitimation could position themselves differently with respect to some of these norms. Because some states can invoke some of these things in a different way from other states. So these foundational arguments that are sometimes used to ground regimes of territorial legitimation, some are very distinctly ethnocultural. This is the land and territory of the X people, defined often in historical, linguistic, religious terms. Or this state is a distinctive physical environmental entity, or this state is a modern incarnation of a longstanding political territorial entity. And then there's all the ones that can't actually align themselves with any of those three. And following Ali's comment this morning, it's, you know, it's the colonial boundaries, uh, colonial imposed boundaries, uti possidetis, that, you know, that kind of, uh, of, of drive things. Now, the next slide I'm gonna put up, I will only put up there briefly because I'm, it's slightly embarrassing. I would never publish this. But I was playing around with this idea about 15 years ago, and I was sort of thinking, what if we looked at like state constitutions and you know, what states actually advance a kind of notion of we are the state of the X people defined in linguistic or religious terms? And I actually would critique some of what I did here more recently, but I thought, well, there's some cases where it's pretty obvious, you know, official languages or official religions or, you know, a partition of South Asia that was specifically religious in nature that kind of can give these kind of ethnocultural groundings. You can see why this is, you know, dangerous territory in a way. But I do think it, be, it speaks to something pretty important, which is that some ter uh, territorial regimes, the, they're legitimated in some very different ways from the way others are. And the significance of that, I think, finds its way into what might seem some kind of odd ways in which some uh, territorial conflicts seem to be at least somewhat more amenable to settlement than others. So I want to contrast two of them here, the Greece-Turkey and the Ecuador-Peru. And the Greece-Turkey, they're part of the same geopolitical alliance. You'd sort of think actually after the tremendous disruption in the early 20th century, when they kind of had to sort of at the Treaty of Lausanne, they had to kind of agree that, okay, we're gonna leave things the way they were. Um, maybe this is one you might be able to settle. Uh, not so true. And then there's the Ecuador, Peru one, a very volatile one, uh, but that has settled. And I think it's interesting to think about how the different alignments of these regimes of territorial legitimation around these two cases provide some sense of a different way in which uh, a, a kind of nationalist symbolic logic enters into the conflict and its possibility for uh, some kind of settlement. So to start with the Greece-Turkey one, uh, you know, the fact that both Greece and Turkey kind of uh, have this old story 
of, you know, we're somehow rooted in east of the Eastern Roman Empire or the Ottoman Empire. It's still there. You have people playing around in, with making maps uh, in dubiously labeled websites uh, can, uh, you know, sh sort of show the, the, the obvious overlap in these. You know, you've got something that sets the stage a little bit for, for that kind of overlap. But of course, the emergence of the contemporary Greek uh, and Turkish states modern Greece and modern Turkey are very much tied up with uh, the age of nationalism and the spread of the nation state ideal. And it's not just this territorial backdrop that is important, but the human backdrop that goes along with it. So in the Greek case, and here we can think about some of the ways that maps are illustrated that we talked about yesterday, but in the Greek case, this map um, uh, reflects something called the Megali idea, right? And it's, a, it's an idea of Greece that is rooted in the fact that, of course, in, um, uh, in uh, the late 19th century, if you were to look at Western Anatolia, you'd see lots of Greeks actually living there. Um, it's, it's a sense that, that gr the Greece of, of the nation state of Greece should be something more than it is. But of course, this 1927 map, um, this uh, uh, Turkish map, Again, illustrated in evocative ways that I don't have time to talk about here, but but these this is a reflection of a sense of trying to sort of consolidate what was ultimately the core of of the of the Ottoman Empire with some territorial claims on the West that clearly conflict with 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 Greece. So then, of course, this becomes an, a point of great conflict in the early 20th century, as I'm sure everyone knows. And the resulting loss of life and incredible disruption leads to this Treaty of Lausanne, uh, which is, uh, this is a, actually a map from the, uh, from, from the treaty itself, which uh, you'd think might have sort of brought this all to an end. And in one sense it did, it, it shifted the conflict directly away from the particular territories that were um, uh, suggested to be in dispute by the prior two maps. But instead it just sort of morphed into a somewhat different way. I mean, there's still some land elements to, the, to, to this, but it morphed into much more now a maritime dispute these, these days. That's where a lot of the uh, dispute is, although you could think of Cyprus as a kind of pro proxy uh, um, territorial dispute. And um, this uh, Yale Macmillan Center, I think kind of a uh, little program nicely captures, even though it's talking about a different time, what still sort of is a little bit there, which is this conflict between Turkish nationalism on the one hand and Greek irredentism uh, on, on the other hand, which is still kind of, kind of there. So if you look then down to the present, you might say, okay, now they're started this part of the same geopolitical alliance. You know, maybe this thing could calm down. Maybe it would make sense for it to calm down. Who's going to gain more, more from all this? But if anything, in recent years, we actually see this actually growing and expanding. So this idea of the blue homeland, uh, the translation there for the map on the right is, has, has been emerging uh, and along with sort of some new maps that seem to be sort of re reclaiming a kind of lar larger space. And lest this be thought of as just simply the product of a couple of obscure websites, um, you know, here's Erdogan making an address two, three years ago with the blue homeland map behind him. And the blue, of course, is a re reference to an actually pretty aggressive, if you go back to the prior one, a pretty aggressive maritime claim that includes actually a lot of those islands that, uh, that, that Greece uh, has effective control over. So then if we turn to the Ecuador-Peru case, you know, here's a case with... Uh, 30 plus uh, violent conflicts that have broken out over time, um, but one that kind of remarkably uh, settled. Now, I'm making this argument that the, the centrality of a kind of ethnocultural underpinning to the Greece-Turkey conflict, conflict makes it has worked against any kind of resolution. It's important to say that by making this, I'm not claiming that Ecuador and Peru don't have strong nationalist feelings, even feelings that are oriented around peoplehood. Uh, the comment was made yesterday about Benedict Anderson that we, as Trump said, we all have to mention him, but um, uh, that, you know, Benedict Anderson, you know, makes some deal about, you know, the extent to which nationalism, nation state idea really, you know, helped, uh, was, was developed in a significant way in, in South America. 
But when that, uh, it, that notion of Ecuadorianness and Peruvianness, which actually gets exacerbated by the territorial conflict that unfolds, it's not an, an, an idea that's paired with a traditional notion of nation in the same way that Greece and Turkey is. I mean, after all, uh, we're talking about places that have similar language, similar religion, at least in terms of the dominant language and, 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 and religion. Now, both these entities, of course, have uh, can trace their territorial ideas to some historical things. And here I'm going to be cut this very short, but I talk about it in more detail in, in, in the paper. It's kind of odd. Peru can say, you think about itself as, you know, the inheritor of the Incan Empire, um, even though, you know, its population is 60% mestizo and 25% indigenous. And of course, many of those indigenous people were actually taken over by the Incans back in the day. Um, and um, uh, and uh, uh, Ecuador can sort of find some roots in an audencia that uh, existed in, in prior times of somewhat dubious long-term uh, administrative significance. But the real essence of the territorial conflict that gets played out there is rooted in a set of territorial adjustments that occurred in the 17th, 18th, 19th, uh, 19th century. And again, I can't go into the details of this, but we start with much of South America being in one viceroyalty, and then it gets divided up into a bunch of, of smaller scale units with some separate way in which uh, uh, the Audencia of Quito is, is dealt with. And then this map, which is part of my ex exhibition, which we can see in grand form, is reflecting the fact that, well, first of all, there was a viceroyalty of New Granada that developed, and then a period uh, that the Peruvians claim when they actually were given effective control over the area in dispute, uh, and then that morphs into an independent um, uh, uh, republic of uh, Gran Colombia, which is uh, what we're we're, we're trying to look at here and just using this uh, map, which is just so wonderful, you can see this is you know, these territories that are, that are in dispute between the two. And you know, this map is suggestive of the fact that you know, when this was created, um, the Ecuadorians say, look, um, what became all of Ecuador was in including the area we claim in Northwestern Peru was part of, of our, was part of Gran Colombia, so uti uh, you know, we get it. And the Peruvians can say, ah, oh, but there was a Spanish decree in 1802 that transferred control of this to the vice royalty of Peru. And uh, so Isaiah Bowman has this great quote from the 1940s where he says basically that um, each side could make a kind of reasonable historical claim to what's going on. So, what this did was to leave this area that colored in uh, dark, the dark gray on this map uh, as, a, as, an, as an area in, in dispute. And it was very much part of the territorial uh, ideology of Ecuador that actually helped to cement a sense of Ecuadorian nationalism, that Ecuador would be made up of a coastal region, an Andean region, and an Amazonian region. And this large map up here on the, the wall, which was another part of my exhibit, really kind of shows this in more detail. So if you, uh, if, if, if you want to see that, you can do this. And this was a map that was used in textbooks and was you know, very much uh, you know, part, part of what was, uh, was bandied around um, uh, during this period of time. But it's an argument about history. It's a more of a, a somewhat more utilitarian argument. It's an argument about history. It's an argument about physical geography. It's an argument about access to the Amazon, but it's hard to actually mirror, meld that into the same kind of nation argument that you see in the uh, Ecuador, sorry, in the uh, Greece, 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 Turkey case. But that doesn't mean, of course, it doesn't get celebrated. These st stamps are easy to find from Ecuador, sort of celebrating this. And it was even accepted from outside. In the Rumsey collection here is this great South American puzzle, which I included because I just love the colors. But, um, but you know, it's a, this is a, pu a, publish, uh, a puzzle from North America, a kid's puzzle. You can see the Ecuadorian version uh, of, of the border. Well, to make a, a long story short, um, there is a major conflict that develops in the early 1940s that actually ends up in a settlement which largely acknowledges what de facto happened on the ground, which is Peru 
with easier access, um, was able to establish effective control over much of this area. And you might sort of think, OK, well, would this be, bring it to an end? But the Ecuadorians claim coercion and uh, it, they actually uh, are opposing ultimately what is come to be accepted again from the outside just a few years later, as suggested by this news story, also from North America, showing now Ecuador and Peru in the post Rio protocol environment. Well, uh, the conflict doesn't go away. It continues to erupt in the mid 1990s. Um, it erupts again. Ecuador actually does better than anyone expects in that short term conflict. And ultimately it is settled. And it's settled, some say it was part with the, the ability to settle it with, was a reflection of the fact that Ecuador had done better. There are a whole lot of economic and social and political circumstances going on at the time that might have, have helped to explain this. But the point is that it actually, with the exception of a few little minor places, it's now not much something that we talk about. And it seems to me that if we're gonna explain that, we can't explain it by where resources are. We can't explain it in ways other than to recognize that there was at least to some degree a more instrumentalist character to this conflict than, um, than um, a, a deep ethnocultural one. So if I come back to this uh, broad scale map again of all these territorial conflicts, there are some that have been able to be addressed and settled somewhat more easily than, uh, than others. I am not arguing for a moment that it's only ones that are more instrumentalist that can possibly be settled. I mean, after all, we've seen examples of settlement of ones that have an ethnocultural backdrop. I mean, think of France and Germany as it's, it's, you know, what, what, one of the more obvious. Nor am I arguing that everyone that has this more instrumentalist backdrop will, will eventually settle. Maria and I were talking at one point about this, you know, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Peru conflict. Uh, but it seems to me that if you to try to understand at least where there may be a greater propensity for some kind of settlement to be reached, one has to think beyond just these uh, sort of more distributional kinds of things and take seriously the different ways in which nationalist ideologies and senses of nation and state develop. Unless we think these are things of the past, um, Putin's pre-invasion speech to the Russian people over and over emphasized that this is, these are, you know, effectively kind of Russians, you know, these are, we all have started in the same, in the same place. Ukraine is just a region of Russia because this is, is effective, effectively Russia. And so it contributes to what Jordan Branch yesterday called the persistence element. In if you remember his two tripartite scheme of things that we might sort of think about, there's a persistence element, it seems to me, in these regimes of territorial legitimation that can't be ignored. And what means also is that the psychology of nationalism is something that we kind of have to take into consideration when we think about what kinds of maps should we be looking at, even to try to understand where territorial settlements might or might not happen. So you get now actually an ar uh, argument I was making in relationship to that historical claims ar article I wrote, you get some places now that say, let's look at the historical maximum extent of older places to understand where we really see territories in conflict. That's actually a fairly useful way to do that, but not all of those are created equal. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alec. And maybe we could bring uh, Guntram onto the screen, bigger way. Uh, so we, I know we have lunch, but uh, I'm certainly, I think we can take about 10 minutes for questions. So uh, what questions does the audience have? You know, I'd like to begin by asking a question <laughs> with, to Alec, which is about the mollification of national pride. So one of the things that was done with the settlement was to give Ecuador a one square kilometer yes. piece of private property right. under Peruvian sovereignty on which they could build a monument and fly their flag. Right. And that seemed to have been part of the settlement that actually had meaning. Right. So I just like to hear your comments. On yeah, that. yeah. I, it, that, and I do mention actually, actually in the written version of the paper, I mentioned precisely that. So there were, it was interesting because even that little concession actually got a lot of blowback in Peru. This, this is, you know, are, are we opening the gates, you know, here? But I think actually, the best hope often for some kind of way of moving forward 
is if we can somehow get out of the rigidities of the of the of the modern state system where everything has to be either us or them, yours or 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 mine. I mean, it's really interesting. Now it's too late in a way, but there are a couple of political geographers who have done a several year long-term survey in Ukraine about attitudes towards Europe and so forth. There's dramatic differences between Eastern and Western U Ukraine. And you could have imagined before the Russian invasion, you know, what if concepts like parallel sovereignty or you know, some kind of a shared uh, territorial arrangement could have been worked out? It's fair sense that there, this would not have been completely rejected. In fact, what might have been embraced by, by the majority of the population in small parts of Eastern Ukraine. But we can't think about things in that way. It's got to be either us or them. And so it, to me, that little concession actually is a suggestion of how we might, we might move beyond that, but the problem is we're so locked into the either or that it's very hard to do. I believe Peter Bull has a question. So let him ask that if we have Peter online. Oh, no, I didn't have a question. Oh, I must have hit that by accident, sorry. Well, Sorry, Peter, Peter. Peter, that gives me the chance to say I haven't seen you for some years, but we met uh, when we were yes. discussing at Harvard the years I, ago. Indeed, the, the center you you ended up founding. So I was particularly disappointed that you couldn't make it here. So. Well, yes, it's good to see you again, and I do remember you and Doug Richardson coming through and uh, telling us what we should do, and we did. <laughs> Great. Um, this is uh, Bill Rankin. Um, question for Guntram. Um, so the, the Penck um, dot maps, and there's many other um, dotty maps, especially Central European geographers that um, are trying to do a similar sort of absolute method at the same time. I'm wondering, you, do you see those as a, a potential uh, argument about governance, that governance might actually be pointillized in that way? Or are these treated as the preliminary drafts of traditional borders. Um, so if, if, if so, do we see this as part of a process? We start with these absolute methods and then we will end up with the same sort of borders we've always had? Or actually is Peng suggesting we might actually think of uh, sovereignty, identity, governance in ways that are in fact more distributed or pointless or something like that? Thank you. Um, I would say Pink wanted this to be as a basis to reclaim uh, these lands that were taken and especially be, being able to subsume minorities like the Kashubians and Masurs um, on the German side because he claimed them for Germany. Um, he, his intent was to have regular borders. So I think his conception of sovereignty was very old fashioned in that regards. He was always thinking about strong borders, um, obviously under German domination uh, in his preference. Um, I, I'm, thinking of Pink as an inspiration to kind of reverse him and put him on his head and say, well, look, if you really start looking at borderlands, you can see how really interdigitized, to use a, a, again, a more modern term for it, relation are, how intermixed they are, and that it really is a good way to question our belief in discrete territories, which come out of the other really more prominent way of mapping ethnicity, which is choropleth maps using existing administrative districts and coloring them in the, in the color of the majority, which means even population densities don't matter. Uh, they don't come out, they get glossed over. And any minority could be 49% of one minority and the other one is 51, then the 51 gets all. So that reifies this idea of having kind of discrete territories and Peng's map destabilizes that that's what I like about Pank, and that's why I think it's useful for us to think about alternative ways of mapping. Thank you. This is Barbara Mundy. Thank you for those wonderful papers. Um, I'm wondering if you could think for both of you about the role of reproductive technologies. I know, Guntram, you talk a little bit about that, but your very point of the color map brings up the fact that, in fact, when you're dealing with conventional lithography, it's much easier to paint, to, to create something of a solid color. So I'm wondering if there's a kind of feedback loop that happens because of reproductive technologies, or rather, do reproductive technologies create their own unintended consequences for thinking about sovereignty? 
I'll, um, is it directed to me or to both well, of us? To, to both of us, yeah. I'll, I'll, get, I'll let you get, take a first stab at it. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, reproductive technologies, I keep thinking of Roe versus Wade, which thankfully I'm not, but <laughs> reproductive, you're obviously talking about the ability to reproduce maps and, and distribute them more broadly. Is that, is that what you mean? Right, right. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think these are, I think this actually is key to, if you look at the Ecuador, Peru case to how actually that territorial notion kept being forwarded in a way that led to all those, those conflicts, because it became easier and easier, more widely disseminated to put those maps on in books and tech. Uh, there's, there were big, uh, uh, what do you call it when you paint the side of a building? <laughs> um, right, it, murals on the side of buildings um, that that had had these maps. Now that's not directly a reproductive technology, but it's sort of you know a, a, a reflection of how these things became ever more widely disseminated, and that clearly you know plays into the way that a regime of territorial legitimation, if I can use my own awkward phrase, um, uh, it, it advances. And I think that clearly plays into what Guntram was talking about as well. Guntram, you wanna take it from there? Yeah, uh, so wonderful question. Um, I, I, I think in the German case, uh, it was much easier to do these simple kind of block print type maps, those suggestive maps, but with stark black and white, like Penck's map, those were easy to reproduce because they were black and white, yet still very powerful. So I think reproductive technology, especially uh, if you don't, if you're not restricted by color, can have a tremendous influence in, in changing it. And now the next step is, of course, digital reproduction or digital uh, versions of these maps. And how does that go? I think some of the um, some of our maybe belief in the, in the reification of these territories is a little bit destabilized with potentially with digital maps because they're so easily changeable. There's so many of them. Uh, whereas if you print them in a, in a, in a school book, um, if you print them in a journal, um, in a newspaper, Pink printed many of his maps in newspapers, that has a, a more immediate kind of authentic, tangible effect um, that uh, goes along with uh, your wonderful presentations yesterday, yesterday about the uh, the, the Mexican artists, that this, the tangibility of objects, I think also is, is a real important element in kind of reifying borders. And then if you use the right exhibit, like you showed us, you can destabilize it that way. You know, it's just interesting to think about how going forward, the reference to digital, I, I think about now certain media outlets constantly focused on the US-Mexico border and both mapping and, and showing that as a way of really trying to reinforce a certain narrative about migration as a threat to the United States. And, and you know, we're not a country if we can't protect our borders. There's a real power in that, that, you know, is something we should be looking at. Well, um, the, I want to add one, one last thing. Ben Hotem um, has published some wonderful articles about uh, invasion cartography. Um, related to the European borders and the enforcement of the border regime. There you see the same thing as well. How cartography is a technology and it has still power over us. We as scholars can think, oh, they're all rhetorical. Well, that doesn't make them any less powerful uh, if, they're, if they're being used for political means. Thank you. I want to try to channel Frank B.A. for just a moment since he's not here. And Alec, I hate to throw cold water on the idea that disputes that don't involve eth ethnic claims, ethnic or historical claims of that kind might be easier to resolve, but he's written something I found pretty unforgettable about countries where people have seen a particular outline map, a particular logo map for long enough if a small territorial concession is made, there is a psychological counterpart to phantom limb syndrome mm -hmm. that people feel as if they are grieving, they've lost a part of their body. And I, it, I don't know how uh, to draw in psychology. We have, we've been gesturing toward it off and on this, this couple of days, um, but it's, it's such an interesting thing. And then I just wanna say to the room, Let's continue this conversation over lunch.
<laughs> I th sandwiches are waiting and sandwiches don't get better. So, um, but if I could just make a, a that that's a great comment. And, uh, you know, when I went back and revisited my written paper before coming here, I sort of thought the one place I really need to do more with is to make it clear that I'm not suggesting that there aren't cases that are exactly like what you're, what, what you're talking about. But at the same time, I bet if I went and asked you uh, any, you know, sort of random people, uh, well, random people who are aware of what's going on around the world, you know, what, you know, think about, think about the most sort of intractable conflicts that are out there, you know, what's going to come to mind, it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, Japan, Russia, Japan, Korea, China and its neighbors, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, India, Pakistan, Israel, Palestine, uh, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, uh, Russia, Ukraine. Every one of those has this really strong ethno-cultural character to it. So I'm not saying that's the, those are the only ones, but I do think that is that you add that on top of the severed limb and you've got something worth at least paying some attention to. If, if I can add just one thing to that, in Germany, actually, during that whole mapping campaign, there were, there were actually maps published that emphasize saying in German, <clears throat> Deutsche Grenzen zerschneiden dich. So German, the borders are cutting you apart and they use knives in an allegorical map <clears throat> to show how the German body was amputated. This goes back to the whole geo-organic theory of the state that was prevalent during that time as well. So I think there's some real good connections between Frank Belay and what uh, Alec was saying. So nice to see you, Guntram. <laughs> Great to see you, Alec. Hopefully in person soon. I hope so. <laughs>